Welcome back, and this is the Parent Life Show. I'm Katrina Ball, your host, and joining us is Dr. Philip Brownell. He's a registered clinical psychologist from Benedict Associates. And continuing on our couch is Debbie Ray Rivers, as well as John Bronson from the founders of SCARS. And we are talking about the ultimate taboo, child sexual abuse. Welcome, Dr. Philip Brownell. How are sexual offenders treated? Sexual offenders are treated um, in response really to the consideration of how they're assessed. And so a, a sex offender can be assessed as being a low, medium, or high risk. And uh, so basically what's being asked is what is the likelihood that the person is going to re-offend? Uh, low risk people and, me and many medium or uh, risk people can be treated in the community on an outpatient basis, for instance, and that's the way that I would meet somebody in, in working with an offender. Uh, because Benedict Associates is an outpatient um, a clinic. But the people who are treated with more serious, medium, and certainly high-risk offenders, um, those people need to be treated in a residential treatment program of some kind. And so you have those. There are some are freestanding residential treatment programs. And, um, but then there's also residential treatment programs that take place within the residence of a correctional facility. So. Uh, many times the uh, sex offender is, uh, goes through this kind of risk assessment. It's called a sex offender specific evaluation. And if uh, on the basis of that, the level of risk is ascertained and then the person is um, sentenced. So if, there's, if they're sentenced to a prison, then that's hopefully where the, the treatment uh, program takes place. And how is the sus uh, success rate uh, determined? Is there a success rate for the treatment? Well, people uh, can do uh, statistical studies. Um, I don't have the numbers right at my grasp at the moment, but the general um, the general finding is that for younger offenders, uh, like juvenile sex offenders there usually is not a well-established offending cycle in place. <clears throat> and the offending takes place within the broader um, sphere of um, just offending in general, criminal offending, antisocial activity. So that can be turned around fairly with treatment, um, multi-systemic treatment um, in particular. Um, there's a pretty good success rate for that. The older the person is, the more well-established they are in their offending um, cycle, the way they go about doing what they do, <clears throat> the, less, the less success rate in terms of actually um, t turning around a deviant arousal, for instance, or the, their practice of, of offending, the less successful that is. And then what you're doing is you're really talking about um, management. How does the offender manage their life given this uh, tendency to act out uh, sexually? And they have a lot to lose. <clears throat> Sex offenders have a lot to lose. So in a, in a good treatment program that is monitored, uh, where the people are monitored after they get out of prison, um, that also can be, there can be an optimistic uh, view of that. But that needs to be... On, um what are your thoughts on an offender's list? How does that affect the offender? Uh, you mean like a of registration? Tracking, you know, register, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, as you can imagine, that's a, the on the offender. It's a it's a disruption. It's a, um, an intrusion, and many times it limits their ability to navigate in society. But it, in many places, it just it comes with the territory. Okay, as a parent. Uh, how can I recognize a sexual offender? Is there any sort of signs, traits? Uh, um, unfortunately, no. Mm. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and many times people will say, um, and, we, and we hear this, and the people in SCARS know this, 
that uh, the offender can be a trusted member of the family. Mm -hmm. So it's not like there's some mark on their forehead or something like that that you can say, oh, well, there's one. <coughs> it doesn't, doesn't work that way. What is the potential of an abuser, uh, sorry, not an abuser, but the a survivor of child sexual abuse becoming an offender? That's an interesting uh, question, and uh, uh, many people think that if, uh, a, if a child has been abused, then they're, they're going to turn out to be an abuser, and that's um, not necessarily so. What I think is uh, the more important um, observation is that if a child has been abused sexually, they're going to be, um, they're going to be, um, become sexually uh, aware. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, for uh, especially a younger child, um, their body is responding to sexual activity that they don't have um, an emotional, psychological, developmental capacity to deal with, and they don't have a relational context that an adult would have to be able to understand that. So um, many times they become for want of a better term, turned on sexually, but they don't know how to deal with that. They don't know what, what to do with that. And it, and it feels bad. So um, that's the more important thing to me uh, th for children who are abused. It's not that they're necessarily going to turn out to be sex abusers, but the, they need help to deal with what they've right. experienced. How can we recognize as adults and members in the community uh, if a child is being sexually abused? Um, I'm sure the people in, uh, that John and Debbie have uh, spoken to this, maybe not, mm -hmm. but um, many times there's a disruption in the child's um, school mm -hmm. activities there. Um, <clears throat> and this will be something that will just, uh, pe if people are noticing, they'll notice a change. Mm -hmm. That something is happening, the child has gone quiet, the child is uh, reclusive, the child is not doing well in school, the child is... Um, disrupted. Mm -hmm. So um, that plus other kinds of uh, disturbing um, observations, the child is uh, urinating, the child is preoccupied with their um, sexual or uh, genitalia uh, or other people's. Mm -hmm. um, many times a ch somebody who has been abused will start acting out the stuff that they've, uh, th that they've started experiencing in some way. And often this takes place in the school. John, do you want to add anything very briefly to what Dr. Brownell yeah, said? I mean, I, I, I mean we certainly uh, with at SCARS agree with everything he said. Uh, the, the one thing that we would say is, um, and that we're trying to do with SCARS, is to provide a program called SAFE, which is SCARS Arms Family Through Education. And within that program, we're trying to provide and educate parents as to what they should know and teach their children. Because one of the steps in preventing child sexual abuse is enabling the child to establish appropriate boundaries. Also, um, as parents or caregivers, establishing a behavior that our children can appropriately model. As I, Dr. F Dr. Phil Burnell has indicated, um, a lot of times kids, when they've been sexually abused, they begin to act out the type of behavior that has been inflicted on them. Um, and so, you know, through establishing appropriate behaviors, constant light of dialogue, we say start early and talk often, um, it helps to serve as a vehicle to prevent this crime from happening. Thank you very much for all of you being guests on our show, Parent Life. And we would just like to say that if anyone of our viewers uh, in our audience has ever been abused themselves or know of someone that has been abused, please, please speak up now. Uh, contact either Sheila Cooper, Coalition for Protection of Children, Debbie Ray Rivers, or John Bronson from SCARS. Uh, contact the police. Do you think that offenders can be rehabilitated or treated? Visit our YouTube channel, Parent Life. Leave your comments and your opinions. I want to especially thank Fairmont Southampton for allowing us to be able to film here. And we want to thank you as the viewers for watching. This is Parent Life TV, the lifestyle network for parents. Brought to you from Bermuda Parent Magazine.